soil is stuck together. Um, and the density of the soil, um, the kinds of soil biology that's in that soil, and then down along the side, the profile of the soil, or how air and water moves through that, that soil, um, is typically not tested. Um, is, you know, some of these things can be tested, but they're, they're difficult. Um, and some, most of these are best looked at by field observation um, in the soil. And that's uh, something I think landscape architects need to learn how to do. So in my book, there is, a, 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 on uh, chapter 8 and part 1, there is a, a, a whole section on how to look at all of the parts of this diagram um, and how, how to work with their interrelationships. So the first big myth we're going to look at today is organic matter. Um, and we often feel that organic matter is, is, is critical to soil, which is true. Um, but we have some bad misnotions um, about organic matter. The first of these is we have to understand the difference between the word compost and the word organic matter. So organic matter is what we test for when we look at um, a soil test and it says it's 4% organic matter, and that's the percent of dry weight um, in the soil. Um, and then in uh, compost is really very short-term decaying organic material, um, often plants. Um, and most compost is only about 35 to 70% organic matter by dry weight. So the, there's a huge difference between organic matter in soil, one being long-term, um, and the organic matter in compost, which is really short-term. So this long-term organic matter in soil is really coating the soil particles and helping them to stick together. And the other thing is that it is very stable in the soil. It tends not to change uh, very much um, with time. In, in the soil. It'll stay pretty much where, where it is. The organic matter in compost, however, when you mix it into the soil, is just blobs of, or, of, of this composting material that is between the soil particles. So it's, it's separated from the soil particles. It's also still composting and decaying, and it's not stable. So much of the organic matter in that soil test, if you test a, a, a sample of of a composted, uh, compost soil soil mix, um, a lot of that, com that organic matter is going to oxidize with time um, out of the soil as carbon dioxide and really just disappear. So it's, it's really a totally different kind of arrangement. Jim, can uh, I interrupt you for just a second? Sure. Would you mind saying a little bit louder? Oh, OK. Thank I'm, you. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, so when we add. Uh, compost to soil. If we if we add uh, the amount of compost that would be equivalent to 10 to 15 percent by volume um, into the soil, we'll actually only increase the soil organic matter by about one to two percent dry weight in the lab test. Um, and this is a very important distinction, and why I think we should, in our specifications. Um, separate the words compost and organic matter. Never call compost organic matter. Uh, we and, and never refer to uh, organic matter when you're really talking about uh, compost. Just a quick word on uh, what we need to be looking at for compost. Um, there's, there's huge amounts of specifications on compost, but I think we can look at it much more simply. Um, I like the, to use the Solvita test. Um, which measures the amount of carbon dioxide coming off of the soil, uh, off of the compost, and you can do this in your um, office. Um, you can buy a Solvita test kit, or you can send it out to a lab. We need to worry about the pH, um, and we really would like to be below seven um, for trees. But I'm finding it increasingly that it's difficult to get low pH compost, depending on the market you're in. To me, the most important thing about is this really good compost is the color. So I like to use a 70% dark chocolate bar 
Um, and if it's really good compost, those chunks of material you see in the picture here should be generally the same color on the inside as the outside. So I might also worry about salt. I might worry about um, uh, biological uh, problems, E. coli, other things that you, you might want to look for. But generally, if you get meet the, the first parts of this um, uh, recipe that's on this screen, you'll generally get good, uh, reasonably good quality compost. The other thing I think we, we, need, we need to touch the soil. We need to become very familiar with these materials. Um, and we should be smelling everything. Um, so everything about soil translates to some kind of soil over, odor. So compost odor, uh, if we, we should know what good um, composted, what, what good aerobic um, material smells like. If you don't, uh, go into any gar good garden and reach down into the soil and grab a handful of the dark material that's um, just below the surface. And whatever that smell is, that's what you're looking for in compost. If you can smell something that's like denatured alcohol, um, it's really reflecting a high degree of incomplete compost, and I wouldn't purchase that. And if you can smell an anaerobic odor in the compost, um, uh, the kind of odor you might uh, smell in, when you clean out your uh, bathroom uh, sink trap, um, then that compost has, has been too wet for too long, and I probably would not, I would not buy that compost also. This is a very hard thing to put into a specification, um, but you can put it in the specification. Um, and you need, we need to be that, that uh, sufficient. Um, so the next myth is that trees use organic matter. And somehow that these trees are going to eat up all of the organic matter. All that organic matter is going to disappear. So here's a set of trees that have never had a single leaf uh, dropping into the soil. Uh, there actually is some pretty good soil underneath that paving, and the trees are growing pretty well. Um, but, the, but the reality is that trees are net contributors of organic matter to soil, um, because most of the organic matter is coming from the roots, not from the decaying uh, material uh, that's coming out, falling out of the canopy. The leaves, as they decay, only contribute about 20% of the total organic movement into the soil. And 80% um, may come from the roots, either uh, roots living and dying and decaying, or um, uh, this idea of exudates, where we have um, pure carbohydrates coming out of the leaves from photosynthesis and going directly into the soil from the roots. Um, and this number can be quite high uh, depending on the species. While we're here talking about organic matter, we also talk about mycorrhiza. Um, and mycorrhiza do really good things in the soil when they're present. Um, but the reality is that it's difficult to show the, the benefits of, of that, that these beneficial effects happen in landscape applications. The tests for what happens to mycorrhiza are almost always done in sterilized soil. So you add a little bit of mycorrhiza and you get these marvelous mycorrhiza blooms like you see in this photograph. Um, but, but when we put it into a landscape soil, uh, we often find that this doesn't actually happen. Part of this is due to the fact that the inoculants that you're purchasing uh, actually don't go through the shipping process very well and they're often not viable. Second is that there's already a lot of mycorrhiza present in almost all soils. Even uh, construction fills have got mycorrhiza spores. So it's difficult to improve upon that. Um, and also plants have other mechanisms if they're not uh, inoculated. Um, and mycorrhiza actually takes resources from the plant. So it's, it's not a total give, but it's a give and take. And there's a little more given than taken. So the, the tree doesn't really gain a huge amount by, by having mycorrhiza. Let's move on to the next myth, um, uh, is sand and soil mixes, um, and that these manufactured sand soils are really good um, things to be working with. And there are 
um, places where they may be the, the right material, but I think that we're over dependent on them. Um, essentially, we start all of the information about these manufactured soils uh, comes from the golf and athletic turf um, industries. Uh, there's a lot of money for research there. And um, for growing plants that, that, that you're walking around on and playing on, they're actually pretty good um, ideas. Um, but are they um, really what we should be doing for, for trees and plants, especially in, in no irrigated landscapes? Um, so they may not actually be as compaction resistant as you think. They're very dry soils and they require frequent uh, irrigation. And this frequent fertilization and water creates uh, turf disease problems, um, and so we and we really would prefer, desire to reduce water and fertilization um, in our soils. So, can we put too much sand in the soil? Absolutely. Uh, can we put too little sand in the soil? Absolutely. If you if you're adding sand to the soil, you only want to add enough so that the uh, the soil begins to drain. Um, if you are putting in, say, 40% or 30% by volume sand, you're not going to improve the drainage in that soil, and you actually might make the soil worse once the soil becomes compacted. Um, and many soils, most soils, will grow do quite fine without sand. Uh, the lower left-hand uh, slide here is a heavy clay soil in Texas. Uh, that's supporting fine tree roots down four feet deep um, into the soil. And this is soil, you, if you grabbed a lump of that, you could make a coffee cup out of it. It's really heavy clay soil. Um, but it, and it doesn't need sand uh, to make it worse or to make it, to make it better. Now, there's always exceptions, and turf is one big exception on the sand. And, and, and we, I'm in total agreement that for turf, um, especially high impact turf, such as the National Mall, we want to get up to about 70 or 75, 80 percent uh, coarse sand um, in the mix to do the things that that industry uh, has, has developed. Now, one of the reasons why we add so much sand into our soils, I believe, is because we screen soils as part of the harvesting process to take out all of the lumps and clumps and rocks and things. And when we screen soil, it drains very, very poorly. So if we just put down screen soil, it's not going to drain nearly as well as it, as it would drain and function before we screened it. Um, and what we're, what we're doing with screening is we're eliminating the soil pads, the clumps that are in, within the soil that's part of the soil structure um, that are, are absolutely critical to making that soil drain. So the more we screen the soil, the more sand we have to add uh, to it. So I'm uh, trying to encourage us now to eliminate um, screening altogether or only doing a light screening. Um, I think we can accept 5 to 10 percent rock in soil. Um, I have talked to soil scientists that think that number could be much higher. Um, but we should eliminate the word free of from our specs. Uh, to keep the soil free of rocks and free of roots and other things. Um, even a beer can now and then um, has no negative impact on the plant, um, but taking that beer can out might have a huge impact on the quality of the soil. When we go to these, um, these non-screened uh, heavier soils, we're going to have to change the way we, we install them. We can't drive over them in lifts the way we normally do with sand soils. Uh, we have to install them more in rows, um, where we, we put in a row in two lifts and then another row of soil and work our way out. So we're constantly driving over the subgrade uh, of the, the, the area to be filled with soil, not uh, over the finished soil. We also have to rethink irrigation. We've gotten ourselves in, in totally dependent on irrigation, partly because of these sand-based manufactured soils. Uh, this is the mall in, in Washington. Um, these trees, uh, elm trees, are growing in a, an unscreened soil, three feet of soil that was 
put there uh, by Frederick Longstead. Uh, except for the Dutch elm disease problem, the trees have done fabulously, except for uh, the Folklife Festival and some other events that are held in this area. The turf grows quite well. The, this place is essentially not irrigated. Um, occasionally, they'll put water on it after an event during a drought. Um, but these uh, plants are doing quite well in Washington, D.C. with no irrigation, growing in an unscreened loam soil. So let's move on to some other my favorite topics, uh, tree grates. And I hear all the time, well, we need to put the tree grates down because they protect the tree. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, tree grates are responsible for lots and lots of damage to trees. They, they, they grow up to the edge of the grate. Um, designers will say, well, shouldn't the owner have come out and cut the next ring away? And the reality is that that happens some of the time, but most of the time it doesn't. This tree is actually uh, on the National Park Service project, and they couldn't get to it. So um, we shouldn't put an object like this um, into the, the space the tree is going to have to occupy. So a tree has a trunk flare that's going to be two to three times the expected trunk diameter. And then it has these really heavy zone of rapid taper roots that are the, the first uh, structural set of roots that hold the tree up. And these trees are pushing upward. These roots are pushing upward. The trunk flare is pushing outward and upward. And we shouldn't put anything in the area um, of these two objects that is going to conflict with their function um, in the tree. So if you start looking around, you'll see that either the tree totally destroys the tree grate, um, or the tree grate destroys the tree, or both. Um, and as, as designers, especially if you're saying you're a sustainable designer, get rid of anything that is close to the tree. This idea that we have to be able to walk right up to the face of the tree is just a horrible, misguided, unsustainable idea, and we need uh, to simply get rid of it. So the tree grates don't protect the tree. They hide problems with the trunk flare. They're still a tripping hazard as they're being lifted. Um, they will eventually girdle or damage the tree. They're very expensive. Take that money and spend it on soil to make the tree grow better. So designers all over the world, this happens to be in England, but I see it everywhere. There's this feeling that we need to have the, the trees growing out of the pavement, so you can walk right up to the pavement. And yes, that might win design awards, um, but we all know intuitively this is the, the, the worst possible arrangement for these trees. Um, we need to give uh, the, the, the things about this, the things that the tree needs um, have to be provided for in our design. We're designers, and, and the science of trees is part of the design that we have to accommodate um, in our design. There is this material called a resin-coated gravel that people are putting around uh, trees. It's actually not uh, all that bad as long as you don't put it right up to the face of the tree as this uh, uh, insulation does. Um, they will, it will do some damage to the tree. Um, but the good thing about this resin-coated gravel is that it's not very strong the tree can break it apart um, and push it out of the way um, if it's not put right up to the, the tree right after it's installed. And I generally start seeing this cracking and breaking apart after just a couple of years. So usually the designer is gone, and I don't want to you know, hit too hard on the designers that are here. Um, but you can take your picture, win your award, uh, then the tree will push this quietly out of the way after a couple of years or five years. Um, the tree will be happy. You'll be happy. I, I hate to be so cynical, um, but that's kind of how I feel about uh, you know, putting anything around uh, at the base of, of a tree. So this is what the tree must do. It's going to, to build these structures uh, that are going to be above the ground. Um, and we, we've got to accommodate them. That's, uh, so we spend huge amounts of money making these uh, very, very tight constrictions around trees uh, that have, have no actual function uh, for the urban landscape. 
Uh, there are other ways of designing the landscape to avoid that. Now, some people might say, well, just couldn't we make the, the tree grade bigger? And that doesn't really do much for the tree. It, it does help a little bit with uh, enlarging the soil volume at great expense, I might add. Um, if you're going to make something bigger about a tree grate, make the hole in the center of the tree grate as large as you can possibly stomach. I think about uh, 24 to 30 inches is sort of the minimum hole size for me. By the time the tree gets that big, uh, maybe it's, it's pushing up as fast as it's pushing out and maybe can kick that tree grate out before it, it starts to damage the tree. But start thinking of tree grate designs that have very, very large holes if you absolutely feel you have to use them. There are lots of alternatives. Um, um, just dirt is not bad. Uh, maybe you feel like to keep people from walking in there, so put a big stout uh, railing around it. Uh, um, planting uh, in these spaces is, is a very, very good um, compatible uh, thing to put around trees. Uh, you may not like that aesthetic. Um, but the lower right-hand corner is in front of the White House, and Michael von Wackenberg won a very nice award for, for that particular design, so somebody thought it didn't look too ugly. Um, I, I think we have to rethink our aesthetics um, on trees in the city. Uh, this is the trees uh, detail at Battery Park City in New York. Um, it's just dirt. Uh, the tree is planted right at the sidewalk grade. Um, and uh, there are lots of lawyers within walking distance of this tree and, and lots of millionaires and really high design going on, um, yet it still functions quite nicely uh, to meet everybody's need at Battery Park City. All right, the next thing I want to look at is rethinking the existing soil in our cities. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in the 80s telling everyone to, you know, that the soil in, in urban areas was horrible, but the more I look around, I see that actually sometimes there's good soil. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we see some very nice trees growing in Brooklyn, um, yet one block away um, on the right-hand side, we tree, see trees that are failing miserably. So we need to know when we have good soil. Um, when we might have soil we can work with. And we also uh, don't want to fall in the trap of making the situation worse uh, by taking soil out that could support tree roots, um, like this center photo, uh, putting uh, tree roots down four feet uh, into the ground and um, uh, replacing it with a manufactured soil that, that might not nearly be as, as good for trees as, as this soil is. So if we're going to rethink that, we have to understand what the soil is. Um, this is a project I'm working on in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, and we did a very extensive soil analysis, about 20 uh, test pits that we dug with our soil auger, um, analyzing the, the different kinds of soils that we found across the site. Um, and we found that in some places we actually had undisturbed soils or remnants of undisturbed soils and other places we had um, almost no soil at all. Uh, so it's really incumbent on us as landscape architects to do that kind of uh, investigative work. So these soils, may you may even think they look terrible. So here we have the subgrade material at a construction site. Is that OK soil to use? And, and I think it could be. Uh, the only thing this soil is missing is organic matter um, and um, uh, uh, breaking up compaction. If I add compost to this soil and break up its compaction without screening it, um, just fracturing it, I can make a very good soil out of, out of that brown stuff. And on our old development sites, there may be layers of good soil that we could reuse um, in, in the process. I need you to learn about color and what color of soil tells us about the, the, the quality of soil. Um, I need you to learn about structure and, and that little ped that I'm holding in my hand, um, how uh, strong that is and how much it might contribute to uh, the overall uh, health of the soil. And I need you to learn about soil odor and start smelling soils, um, looking for uh, different chemicals that might be in the soil, 
uh, anaerobic conditions, uh, organic conditions. Um, you can tell all these with your nose, uh, and it doesn't take a, a lot of um, high-tech equipment, or, nor does it take a lot of time um, for you to learn how to do this. Um, this is a, a project where we had um, a planting bed that had about six inches of topsoil laid over all different kinds of subsoil conditions. Um, all we did was we slow, carefully dug out the soil down 24 inches, um, put it in a pile in, in slide number two, and then took um, four scoops of, of pile, uh, pile A with one scoop of the compost, um, mixed it together uh, right there with the backhoe, and put it back in the hole, uh, compacting it um, as best we, we could. We mix in the gravel, the, the, the subsoils, uh, all of the material gets mixed together um, and actually makes a very, very good soil. Now, in urban soils, there's going to be con soil contaminants uh, from salt um, and toxicities of different kinds, oils, uh, cements, raised pH, um, different things that we need to be able to observe um, in um, the soil. But we have to remember that we're, generally when we talk about toxic soils, uh, we're talking about toxicity for humans, and those are generally measured in parts per million. Uh, where toxicity for plants is actually only parts per thousand or even parts per hundred. Um, so it takes an awful lot of salt, for example, to kill a plant. You've got to get it up to uh, one one percent or two, one and a half percent um, of the total soil. Um, uh, so that's an awful lot of salt to actually kill a plant. Um, but we can uh, injure the plant. Um, and so we need, we need to know, you know what we're dealing with. And soil tests will help us with that. Um, if you think you've got a, a chemical problem or the history of the site tells you that you need to be starting to be careful, get an expert. Uh, it's, um, if you're starting to deal with certain kind of chemicals, lead, for example, uh, is not an area that you as a landscape architect should be uh, messing around with. You should, at that point, get, get somebody who, who knows what they're doing. So the kinds of things that we do mostly are raise pH. Uh, we have soils that are heavily over-fertilized that may have very high levels of, of some chemicals, and we add salt to the soil. Um, those are the three main chemical change problems that you're, you're going to run into. Uh, the pH rise is typically solved by simply putting in plants that can handle the, the high pH. The over-fertilization um, may, again, be wanting to look at, at uh, the kinds of plants that we're putting in. And salt generally can be leached from the soil um, unless you're in the south, the very arid southwest. Um, it's hard to get enough water in the soil to leach the salt out, although that is a, a practice um, that, that is used. But again, many of your southwest desert plants are uh, able to tolerate fairly high salt. Um, and if you have a salt condition, you may want to look for those plants. Um, the leaf color will often tell us different kinds of, of soil toxicity problems. Um, and uh, there are, are books, um, one by Larry Costello, um, that show good photographs um, of leaves of trees uh, with different kinds of soil toxicity problems. We need to remember there's a difference between airborne salt and waterborne salt. So the trees on the, the left have had their buds burned off by salt that was coming up off the road, being put into the air by the speed of the car and the tire, um, and then coating the buds, killing the buds of the tree. Um, on the right-hand side is a tree that was killed by salt that was sprinkled on the ground, uh, the, the, the snow melted, went into the, the tree pit itself, and killed the tree. Um, you'll notice that of those two trees, one is dead and one is not. The tree that died um, had a tree grate around it, um, a flush to the pavement that collected the salt, where the tree that lived did not have a tree grate, um, but had a concrete lip around the edge that deflected the runoff uh, from, from the tree. 
Um, in pH, uh, a lot of times I hear people say, well, we have too high a pH, so we should just lower the pH by adding sulfur products. Um, and the reality is that you can't lower pH over a long time um, with sulfur. You, you have to keep adding sulfur um, every year, um, and it's difficult to do, especially in urban soils, um, urban sites where you might not be able to incorporate the sulfur into the ground. Um, it's difficult to imagine a long-term sulfur treatment program that would be successful. So again, pick the plants that are pH adaptable to the pH uh, that you actually have. So um, the concluding idea here is if you want to be a better landscape architect, um, I want you to start or keep on gardening. I, I need you to touch and smell the soil. I need you to learn the products that we are, are, are working with um, in our industry. Um, get uh, your head out of the desk, away from your computer, and, and learn these materials, learn the processes that are going on, um, and become familiar, become an expert in, in your field of expertise. Um, you should be able to fairly quickly get to the point where you don't have to hire experts uh, to make these otherwise fairly simple um, decisions um, that we as professionals should should be able to be smart enough to how to do. So I think that concludes the, the, the actual presentation. We've got about 15 minutes uh, for questions and discussion. Um, uh, all of the, uh, this and more is, is in my book, um, Up by Roots, um, which is available on Amazon.com. Um, and also, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I get uh, quite a few emails with people asking questions. Um, and I'm happy to always answer short questions or, or direct you. Um, and if, if it's a project and you really need some, some serious help, um, of course, I'm always available to be hired. And I'll tell you when I think you've reached the limit of your free uh, question and answer period and say, OK, it's time that you bring me in on the project as a consultant. Uh, but um, again, I'm, I'm very happy to, to entertain uh, questions over the email as you're working uh, through these particular problems. Thanks, so, Lita, why don't we yeah. uh, to questions? Yeah, yeah, we will. We have, we've had plenty come in, so let's get started. Um, the first one is about recommended soil volumes um, for small, medium, and large urban trees. Can you speak to that at all? Okay, well, uh, there's been a fair amount of work on um, fair amount of work on um, soil volumes. Uh, and that is summarized in my book in a, a, a chart that shows the size tree you can expect and the amount of soil it would take to get there. One, one of the, the, the things that I see people doing is thinking they have to pro either provide all of that soil or because I, I only gave, and I was only able to put in, say, um, uh, 150 cubic feet of soil, the, the tree will never get any bigger than that. And we need to go back to this idea that if we understand how to do a good soil analysis, um, we, we, we can learn that often there is rooting space under that sidewalk. It may not be perfect, but there, it, it will, the roots will get out to, to some extent. Um, there's also the idea that if I only have a small soil volume, I should put in a small tree. And if, if I did, in fact, have a very small volume and I knew that I would never get the, the tree out of that volume, I, I would definitely, uh, say, put in a, a smaller tree. Um, but the problem with that, one, uh, with, with a few exceptions, most of our small trees actually are more prone to disease and insect uh, problems, and they tend to be more short-lived than the, the larger trees. Um, so you're kind of uh, setting the, the parameter, um, which limits the, the size tree you'll ever get. Also, if you're in an area where actually you might get rooting out, um, if you put in a small tree, you are sure that you will only ever get a small tree. 
Um, so if I were to plant five good sized trees, maples or oaks, and frankly, uh, by the way, maple's not a great urban tree, um, then um, if I plant those small trees uh, in, in that kind of space, I, I assure again that we'll only ever get, ever get a small tree. But if I plant larger trees and half of them actually find rooting space, I will create some, some large trees in the urban environment. Uh, so it's a bit of a, of, of a risk um, as to which way to go. Uh, and I think that you can get smart enough quickly uh, to, to make pretty intelligent decisions about uh, what, what to do. OK, great. Um, going back to earlier in your presentation, you talked about tree root exudates. Um, uh, the question asker wants to know, in your opinion, what percentage of organic root exudates could you expect? Um, and in urban soils that are depleted, how, how do those exudates become available to the tree? Okay, well, the, 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 the exudates, you've got exudates and you've got root de decaying roots. Um, so that the fine root system of tree is constantly living and dying. Um, in, even in a forest, the, the fine network of feeder roots might only live for a couple of weeks to a, a month. Um, and then those die, and as they die and decay, they deposit organic matter into the soil. Um, the exudates are coming out on the root surface, and those uh, in, in an area called the rhizosphere, which is only about a micron thick, so it's, you can't actually see it. Um, so the combination of decayed root um, material and uh, exudates um, might be as, as much as 60 or 70 percent of the, the total um, uh, contribution of organic matter to the soil, um, and that's traveling with the tree as it's growing. So its, it's, it's, it's influence is getting greater and greater each year as the tree grows. So if I'm starting with a tree with very low organic matter, uh, a soil with low organic matter, that, that organic matter should increase, but if I have a very low organic matter to begin with, I'm not likely to get a lot of roots uh, that will grow into that soil. So it's kind of a catch-22. If I get to a certain level, the tree will build better soil, but if I'm not at that level, um, the, the roots are going to have a difficult time growing into that soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're starting at zero, you're not going to probably increase it. But if you're at, at say, 2% organic matter soil, which actually is not an all that bad soil. Um, there are plenty of farm soils in the U.S. that are two two to three percent, um, then I, I have a really good shot at, at maintaining um, a, a, a good soil and actually improving that soil uh, with trees. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, the next question is, what is your opinion on porous pavement material in place of tree grates? OK. Well, first of all, I'd like to, to in, when we're talking tree grates, there really should not be anything on top of, of of that area, that 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 area of, uh, directly around the tree for the first three feet in all directions or four feet in all directions, ideally should just be dirt, mulch, or plants. Um, if you have to pave it, then the next thing I would put down would be a gravel paving. Um, and if I couldn't do that, then I would put the the resin stabilized gravel. If I have to put a something stronger on it, you've already, in my opinion, crossed the line and you missed the, the, the mark as to what we were, we were supposed to be doing. And I, and I should say that on projects I work on, tree grates are used all the time. I, I cannot get rid of them. It, it is so hard to, to convince designers that these things shouldn't be used, uh, even with all of my um, knowledge and, and hopefully argumentative skill. I, I still lose the argument half the time. Um, but if I, if I had to put a paver on it, it should be a loose set paver um, with as wide a joint as I can make it set on sand um, and set with the root ball as close underneath that paver as I can get so that as the tree grows, it can kick those pavers out. 
whatever system you put there is going to disappear. It's going to disappear in five to ten years. It, the tree must destroy it. Um, and, you, and if you don't accept that, then I, I can't do much for you. It's, it is a fact of, of the reality of trees. They, they have to produce trunk flares, and they have to produce zone of rapid taper roots. Mm -hmm. The next question is about accommodating both the needs of trees and people. Um, and the question is, it's fine to say we need to accommodate trees whose roots um, you know, need to spread out right around the tree opening, but urban trees, especially street trees, exist in the same place as people and pavements. All have to be accommodated, don't they? Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, and that, that gets us to the, the, the trek I've been on for the last 35 years. Um, to try to develop way, different ways of putting tree roots under pavement, uh, which started out with our very simple soil trenches in Bethesda and at National Geographic in 1980, um, moved through a period where we looked at, uh, I looked at something called root paths that I'm still not convinced are, are entirely viable, although they, I think they do have application. Um, we looked at various kinds of vault systems that have been built all over the world, um, concrete uh, uh, covers um, that, are, that are structurally supported. We then, and we're still in a period of, of structural soils, which if you read the book um, up by roots, you'll find that I don't have a very good opinion about structural soils, even though I was one of the uh, founding people on the structural soil um, juggernaut, and I also wrote the specification for uh, structural soil after Nina and Jason uh, developed the formulas. So, the, but in the, in the end, I found that we really needed to put lo lots of loam soil, and that led us in, into the direction of silva cells, um, which I helped deep root uh, uh, create. Uh, and that came off of a project, uh, started with a project that Peter Walker had developed uh, in Japan called Sky Forest, where he essentially built a, a custom version of silva cells, if you will. Um, and the trees are fabulous. I mean, they, they, they were the best solution. And so the idea of silva cells was to um, come up with a, a, a pre-engineered pre system that would be easy to put in in all projects. Great, thanks. Um, getting back to tree grades for a minute, the next question is um, back about those. And it's, is the big problem convincing designers not to use tree grades related to access requirements for people with disabilities, ADA, and so forth? Well, I don't agree with that. Um, I have never seen a tree grade that was in the root of access. Um, it's all, there's always a route of access around the tree grate. Um, there's the thought that, well, maybe a handicapped person might get into this space. And, and that could be true, but there's always a space around it. We only need, uh, we only need four feet of, of sidewalk width to have a, a handicapped person move around um, a tree. Um, if but are designers citing ADA as a reason are. for they justifying tree grates? They, they are saying, well, we need this tree grate to meet ADA, and that's absolute rubbish unless the tree grate itself is part of the root of access. Uh -huh. um, and if it is part of the root of access, you're in big trouble because that, that tree grate is going to lift. It's going to move. The tree is going to move it. Uh, so uh, then it no longer becomes a, a, a useful part of the root of access. Uh, these tree grates always lift um, if the tree grows. Now, a lot of times they don't lift because the tree doesn't grow or the tree grate kills the tree, but I don't think that either of those are, are reasonable um, things to talk about. Uh, we, we must assume the tree is going to grow and design systems that allow it. Mm -hmm. So my, my recommendation is that instead of asking how do we make the area immediately around the tree the route of access, that the better question is how how do we um, make a, a good route of access for to meet the ADA and take this zone out of that? Be very clear: this is not part of the handicap uh, accessibility, or it's actually not a space we want anyone to be walking. Somebody could walk in it, 
um, uh, just as they can walk in a planter. They could wade through the water on a, on a water feature, um, but they're not, we don't encourage them to. And we need okay. to make that very strong uh, definition. Transitioning over to um, water a little bit, can you comment on planting street trees at street level with gaps and curbs to allow for infiltration of street runoff into soil trenches? Yeah, um, one of the things that, that we have learned is that getting water into the soil, um, regardless of what kind of soil it is, a structural soil or a vault or uh, silver cells or just an open planter, getting water in there is absolutely critical. Um, and we, so we need to put sidewalk water and we can put street water into there. Um, in most market areas, um, there, the water that's coming off the street is perfectly fine. The, the trees handle hydrocarbons, oils, um, uh, lead, uh, frankly. Um, we no longer have lead in our gasoline, but um, the things that come off streets are, are not a problem. Um, for, for the tree. Uh, the biggest problem may be putting too much water in there, and therefore we always need to make sure we have some way of, of getting drainage out the bottom, but we also need to get the water in. Now that leads us to the, the big question of salt, and salt running off um, into, from, from the sidewalk into the tree pit um, and killing the tree. You've anticipated our next question, which yes. is if and you deflect runoff, yeah, uh, how do you yeah. collect stormwater? Right. I do a lot of work in northern climates, um, and frankly, I don't see a lot of salt damage from waterborne salt in our street trees, but occasionally you do. I showed you an example of one um, in, in the pictures earlier, but that tree had been treated with salt for 41 uh, snow events that year. It was a record year for that particular location. And they just spread salt. And they, they, they told us that they spread salt 41 times during the winter, and the tree died. Well, I'm not too surprised. Plus, the tree was growing in a very small hole, um, had no way to get out. Actually, they put a plastic liner around the, the tree pit so that the roots couldn't get out. Um, and so the tree died, and, and I'm not surprised at that. Um, I'm working in Toronto with some very good urban foresters, and, and we've come to the following conclusion, that if you have sufficient soil, um, good soil volume, and you have good drainage out the bottom, the salt will leach through the soil fast enough so that it doesn't impact the tree during the summer. Um, and that to me is the key to it. So it's, it's soil volume um, that's adequate and uh, drainage out the bottom, salt will not be a problem. Okay. The next question is about other planting media. Um, can we plant a tree in almost pure gravel, like the material used under concrete walkways? I'm looking for a less expensive way to plant trees in urban areas than silver cells or CU soil, which cities don't often want to pay for. Right. And the, I, I've been working on this, this problem since 1980, um, and the cost per cubic foot of soil, um, it, it hasn't changed much. I, I can't figure out a way of getting soil in. Um, the roots will grow a little bit in pure gravel. Um, you might get them, um, actually there's some work in, in Sweden right now where they're, they're doing that, but uh, you need to have the same climate and other conditions that they have in Sweden in order to say this work is applicable. Um, but it, the, the, all of the work says it comes down to the soil volume. Um, and actually, if you, when one of the things we wanted to do with silver cells was to bring the cost of, of soil volume down rather dramatically. And as uh, much as I, I try to explain this, it's still a hard thing to understand, um, but silver cells are quite a bit cheaper than structural soil. If you're pricing it out by the cubic volume of, of soil that you're actually providing. Um, so if you have $4,000 to spend on soil, you still provide the best 
um, uh, environment for the tree by spending that four thousand dollars on a on a small quantity of silva cells than you would be to spend four thousand dollars on structural soil. You'll provide an awful lot more soil. Um, so if if you go to up by roots in the part two, there are ten steps to to creating healthy trees. The very first step is to plant the easy places first. So if you've got a low budget, look for those easy places. And the second step is to make the holes as big as you can. So getting those, those holes that aren't covered with tree grates that are just dirt or planted beds or whatever is the cheapest way to put soil into the urban environment. And I, I would challenge anyone to show me a, a design in any picture in Landscape Architecture magazine over the past 50 years where we couldn't have made the planting space a little bit bigger um, and still had the, the, the place function for people uh, and cars to move in and around the, the, the site. Mm -hmm. So Jim, it's it's been about an hour, but we still have a lot of people on the call. Um, if you're willing to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes, there are many questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we could get to some if, if you have a little extra yes, time. Let's, let's do that if there are people who need to drop off. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for, for coming. And the rest of you want to hang in there for a few more uh, questions. Uh, we certainly can go on. We'll go on for another 15 minutes and uh, then call it a day. OK, thank you. So in that case, the next one we're going to go to um, is a question about the major differences between planting trees on terra firma, so to speak, and in on-structure situations, such as a parking garage, for example. Um, can you speak a little bit about soil depth and you know, some of the differences in those planting situations? Right. Well, the, the biggest problem with uh, over garages is usually soil weight. Um, and then the second is soil depth. Uh, so there are, are constraints, either design constraints um, or uh, physical engineering constraints that may um, uh, cause that to, uh, to, to limit the amount of soil that you can put um, on there. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about using lightweight soils to solve this problem. And I'm not a big fan of lightweight soils. Um, I think that, that you, you actually, there's some things that, that the, the, by making the soil lightweight that you also take things from the soil. You're replacing it with, for example, expanded shale, uh, which is going to raise the pH. It doesn't really provide as much water as the expanded shale people might uh, lead you to believe. So you're really just replacing soil with a, a lightweight material. I would, would always recommend putting less soil down than making the soil lighter. So you really, it's just a weight problem. So if, you, if you've got 200 pounds per square foot loading, then put in 200 pounds per square foot of real soil, which means it's going to be only about 18 inches thick, um, instead of putting in three feet of, of, um, of very, very lightweight soil. Um, I think the trees will grow just as well, uh, or maybe even better, in the 18 inches of good soil as they will in the uh, 30 inches or so of lightweight soil mm -hmm. uh, at a lot less cost. Mm -hmm. uh, the other big problem, though, with roof decks is you need to make sure the soil drains well. And that's one of the areas where maybe a sand uh, mix uh, may be important. Um, but making that mix using unscreened uh, loam soil will, will allow you to um, use less sand um, and make that soil have a higher water holding uh, uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you run into the problem of having to pay again to pave over this soil, which is often the case. Um, and there, all of the techniques that we talked about for, for growing roots under pavement, whether or not you're above a, um, a structure, all apply. Um, and you just have to figure out the most effective way of of doing that. Okay, great. The next question is about biochar. Have you used it, um, and what are your thoughts on it? Okay, um, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at biochar, um, and essentially, if you have a reasonable soil, meaning a soil that's got three percent organic matter in it, 
uh, which is pretty available in most uh, markets. Um, biochar really doesn't do a whole lot to improve that soil. In fact, uh, one of the big problems with biochar is it generally has an elevated pH, so you're going to be raising the pH in that soil, uh, which may do some bad things. Um, biochar right now is incredibly expensive, so if uh, if, if my goal is just to get organic matter in the soil, um, I can do it a lot less uh, for a lot less cost by using just good quality local compost. Um, so I haven't I haven't found a good case for using biochar. Um, and re remember that where biochar came, the idea came from the Amazon, uh, where they have very very low organic soils for some climate reasons. It it actually probably made some very good sense in their the, the environment there. I've actually been to the Amazon and, and have dug in uh, the petronegrous soils uh, to look at them. Um, but if you're in most places in the U.S., uh, maybe South Florida uh, might be a, a good place where biochar may have some application. Um, but uh, in the rest of the U.S., I, I think it does not yet have an application. Um, the one exception to that may be stormwater management. Uh, biochar does have a very, very high ability to filter and absorb um, uh, certain chemicals um, in the soil. Again, compost will also do that. Um, so I think the jury is out on, on that one, um, uh, and we, we need a little more research. But I don't think it's ready for prime time by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on tree and plant health in soils with 75% to 80% sand content? Well, I, I mean, trees grow in high sand soils. There's no question about that. Um, but if you go to areas where naturally you have a high sand soil, which it would be, for example, the, the tertiary dune um, in the maritime forests, um, the sand, uh, the pine barrens in, in Long Island or the pine barrens in New Jersey, you're going to find a very, very thin uh, layer of uh, a number of tree species that actually grow in those kinds of, of environments. Um, so you, uh, you're essentially going to be making those soils function better by adding water and by adding uh, fertilizer, um, organic matter. Um, uh, T. Fleischer at Battery Park City uses high sand soils, but he is uh, putting compost teas on them and, and compost all the time, a huge amount of effort to do that. Um, he likes the high sand soils because he, they are somewhat maintainable, um, but Battery Park City has got one gardener per acre uh, to do all of that, not counting the volunteer staff that comes in and also helps. Um, one gardener per acre is not sustainable. Um, as, a, as a future uh, garden. Um, uh, then the, the worst one of those is um, the high line, uh, in which there, I think it's, it's four gardeners to the acre, or three gardeners to the acre, uh, to maintain the high, land, high, the high line in that very high uh, sand soil that was used there. So, uh, the, you know, there's, there, there are trade-offs uh, in all this. But yeah, I can get trees to grow in, in high sand soils, but it's going to take a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about using a system like the Silva Cell for stormwater management and how the stormwater management part of the system interplays with the, the tree growth and just soil part of the system? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we know that trees benefit from a fair amount of water um, regularly added to the soil. Um, but we also know that we can add too much water to the soil. So it's a matter of getting the soil volume, the type of tree, um, and the amount of water that's going in all in balance and understanding that. Um, so we know that if our drainage area is going to pump in more than about 20% um, uh, of the total soil volume in water, um, and so you calculate the the, the, the what they call the pea storm, the 90% 90, 90 storm, which in my area is about an uh, inch and a quarter of rain. I get an inch and a quarter of rain into these, um, the silver cells, 
over the, whatever the drainage area. And if that exceeds 20% of the soil volume, um, I'm going to start introducing too much water uh, into that soil. Um, and I, I've got to start thinking about the ramifications of that. Um, generally, we find that as you add soil, uh, or as you add water to soil, you need to decrease the amount of compost in the soil. So I'm going to get down to, uh, I think, a loam soil would have very low amounts of compost. Most of our stormwater management soil mixes actually have fairly high amounts of compost, 20% uh, or greater by volume. And um, maybe in the sand soil, if everything's functioning correctly, um, it's, going to, it's going to work well, uh, certainly at the beginning. Um, but as that uh, compost keeps decomposing um, and as the drainage rate uh, goes down in those soils, um, I think that it's still yet to be seen what's going to happen um, uh, to, to those soils. Um, also, the slower the water drains through the soil, the more it does for the stormwater part of the equation. Um, and Bill Hunt in North Carolina has done some good work where uh, he's finding that if the soil is draining at more than five inches an hour, it's doing very little for the water. It's not filtering. It's not holding the water long enough to really be effective uh, in any kind of detention, um, retention, or, tr uh, tr or treatment. The ideal amount drainage rate was one inch an hour. That's where you did the most amount of good for the water. But we also know if you design soils that drain at one inch an hour, um, and you start putting a lot of water through it, they're, they're going to fail fairly quickly by clogging up. So Bill and I have been talking about uh, a number of somewhere between two and three inches an hour um, uh, as a drainage rate to the soil. And to get there, you're going to have to put some soil in that sand compost mix, 30% um, soil maybe, or 40% soil. Um, depends on how heavily the soil is screened. And, and keep remembering this screening issue as, as critical to the equation. So if I take the same soil and I, and I send a sample off to the lab that's screened uh, with, say, uh, one part s uh, soil and two parts sand um, and one part compost, and I take that same ratio and put it, send another sample in that's unscreened, the drainage rates that come back from the lab will be dramatically different. I mean, you won't believe the, the difference. This is a difference of uh, three or four inches an hour difference in how uh, rapidly the soil will drain. Um, so start thinking about soil peds and unscreened soils and testing your mixes um, um, at, at those kinds of with those kinds of thoughts in mind. Um, also, when you one of the, the things that I, mistakes I see people doing in their specs is that they will say, well, the soil should drain at, at three inches an hour, for example. Well, that's an that's a irrelevant statement in a specification unless you say how much the soil sample is compacted to, because compaction is also a, a factor in drainage. Um, and again, also the soil ped. So unless you say how much is the soil screened, and how much is the soil compacted when the test is being done, um, just uh, citing a drainage rate that you're looking for um, doesn't mean anything. Uh, so you, you've really got to add in those two other parts to the equation um, in your specification. On that note, let's have the last question um, of the webinar. Speaking of soil compaction, a lot of the solutions we've talked about today center around taking the compaction you know, out of the soil so that the tree can access it. What is the ideal soil compaction for a tree? OK, yeah. The soil that you're going to be adding, if you're putting in new soil, has to be compacted to some level. Um, all soil is, in a sense, gravity will compact the soil. Um, so when you dump that soil off the truck, a loose pile of soil, it's going to have a, a proctor um, and I'm slipping into engineering language uh, for some very good reasons, but it'll have a proctor of about 60 to 65 percent uh, of maximum de bulk density. 
Um, and if I plant a tree in 60% bulk density uh, soil, that tree is going to fall over. I mean, it, it, it is, does, soil does not have enough oomph to it to actually keep the tree upright, and a good wind will push it over. Um, and also that soil is going to settle quite a lot, and the tree is going to settle with it. So the soil has to be compacted to some amount. We all know that as you start getting up to engineering levels of 90% of or, or higher, that roots have trouble or actually stop growing in the soil. So we need to have an upper limit and a lower limit as to what that soil should be compacted to. And I think that that range is somewhere around 75 uh, to 80 or maybe 78 to 83, about a 5% variance um, to tell, keep the contractor um, to make it so it's not too much and not too little. Um, and that's a 5% is a very hard window for a contractor to achieve, so maybe you have to make that open it up to 8% uh, in the range. But always stay above 75% and stay below 85%. So if you had to give them 10%, I'd say 75 to 85, you know, you'll be okay. Uh, but I'd rather tighten that down a little bit more. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming to the webinar today. Um, we've reached the end. Jim, I want to thank you especially for staying on a little extra to answer the many questions that came in. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, remember that you can find out more about Deep Root on our website and our blog, which is updated three times a week. And of course, you can buy Jim's excellent book, Up by Roots, on Amazon, um, as he said earlier. So as I said, I know we didn't get to all the questions. Jim's uh, email address is up there. He has generously uh, said he will answer brief questions. Um, my email address is lita at deeproot.com. I would also be uh, happy to answer anything that I can. And uh, Jim, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. Right, and thanks to everyone who's still on and, and listened, and uh, keep learning. Touch the soil. <laughs> Touch the soil. All right, we'll end it there. Thanks.